just want to say a huge thank you to Community Legal Services of Mid Florida, um, and especially Jeff Harvey, the executive director there, who's uh, passionate about this topic and pulled everything together for this webinar today. I'm turning it over to Jeff. Thank you so much for all your work on this. Sure, thank you. I'm honored to have the privilege today of uh, presenting this this webinar from uh, on behalf of Community Legal Services in Mid Florida. Um, we are uh, approximately have 60 lawyers, and we're really the only resource for about 2 million low-income Central Floridians uh, for civil legal assistance. And being in Florida, we are no stranger to natural disasters um, and, and other types of crisis for that matter. And over the last five years, we've been working very diligently to improve our ability to be crisis ready so that next time we face one, because it's a matter of uh, when, not if, um, that we are able to quickly shift our focus from worrying about the organization and, and its ability to operate and uh, focus then on, on the clients that really need the assistance that don't that just don't have the resources. So um, today you're going to hear from four individuals who have helped us through this series of evolution. And uh, the format today is really to help you kind of provide some um, context, maybe a little bit of outline in terms of uh, things to think about, and then to provide you with access to the resources as well. So uh, I believe that the uh, both the slides and uh, the contact information are going to be made available if they have not already. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, everybody on the on the webinar today. First, um, we have uh, Mr. Dan McCarroll and Mr. Aaron Leonard from Sub Excellence. Uh, Dan has over 30 years working in and on uh, and around information systems. <clears throat> he now focuses on offensive and defensive cyberspace planning in both private and public se sectors. Dan is a CS CISSP associate and PMP certified. And uh, he has co-founded with Aaron, who I'll introduce in just a second, Cyber Excellence to deliver support, assessments, and planning capacity to the private sector for organizations under 500 people. <laughs> and uh, one thing about Dan and, 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 and at least one other person on the webinar today, uh, very, very interested in flying. If you ask him about flying, he will drop everything and go do that. Um, so Dan, welcome. Next, uh, Aaron. Uh, Aaron Leonard is 16 years of experience of financial statement audit, internal audit, and information technology and cybersecurity spanning big four public accounting. Uh, he also has civilian service to the U.S. federal government and military service to the U.S. Marine Corps Reserve as an information systems technology officer. He brings a multidisciplinary approach to the assessment of cybersecurity, risk management, internal controls evaluation, and financial investigations. He uh, typically favors business process design analysis and employee training rather than resilience on uh, reliance on new tech gadgets or solutions that can add unnecessary layers of complexity. So it takes a really interesting approach to that that really allows organizations like ours to uh, to leverage the resources we do have instead of spending money on resources we don't. And so uh, welcome to you, Aaron. And our third panelist today is uh, Gaurav Mukherjee uh, from Emergent Security. Gaurav is an information security and risk executive, as well as a practicing cybersecurity and privacy attorney. Gaurav has over 20 years of experience in the information security industry and has worked with multiple Fortune 500 companies, supporting privacy, security, and compliance in over 170 countries. Gaurav, welcome to you as well. Thank you for, for joining us. And then finally, I'd like to introduce um, the person responsible for this webinar, uh, Veronica Vasquez. Veronica is CLS, CLSMF's Director of Information and Risk Management. She is um, the lead uh, person in our organization that's responsible for compiling uh, continuity of operations plans, disaster plans, and uh, is currently working on um, developing a cybersecurity program for us that takes into account all of the good tips, tricks, and assessments that we received from the other three gentlemen on the, on the panel today. So I'm going to turn it over to Veronica, and uh, thank you again for putting this together. No problem. Thank you. Well, Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Today we are presenting on cybersecurity, building an organization that is prepared for crisis. Shortly you will get the opportunity to hear from three cybersecurity experts in overcoming the internal struggles of becoming crisis ready. They will share their insight and expertise on effective cyber crisis management and how to avoid a cyber incident during a crisis. But before we get started, just a little housekeeping. Right now, I have everyone on mute to avoid background noises that may distract you from listening to the webinar. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel. 
We will have time for questions at the end. I would turn the time over now to Dan and Aaron. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Aaron. All right, thanks, Veronica. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. If we could go on to the, the first slide, Veronica. Um, so this is what um, uh, I'm going to, uh, Dan and I are going to cover today. I'm going to begin by talking about cyber audits and assessments, give an overview of, of uh, what each of those mean and, and the, the process that you can expect um, should you decide to undergo one in your organization. Dan's going to talk about um, crisis response and, and then both topics that I'm covering will feed into your crisis response because uh, the cyber audit is is going to give you that that first level uh, first level of um, understanding of, of how to respond to a crisis, and then your your cyber asset inventory is is going to let you understand what you're trying to protect when you're responding to a crisis. Um, uh, Veronica, next slide, please. And then this is just what I'm going to hit in my, my uh, first part of the presentation. And so um, as my uh, introductory bio said, I uh, started my professional career in accounting and, and big four um, uh, public accounting specifically. And, and so when I think of a, an audit, I think of um, certain things um, where there's an, an audit opinion issue, there's assurances provided in that opinion, and it's, it's done underneath a, a framework, um, U.S. GAAP, U.S. Generally Accepted uh, Audit Principles. Um, when we're talking about cybersecurity audits and, and assessments, um, we don't have uh, a decision-making body in the same way that financial um, statement audits have. And um, we don't have, a, while we have certifications, we don't have um, certified public accountants um, who we traditionally think of doing audits. Um, if you look at the, the AICPA's website, uh, cybersecurity uh, falls under advisory services and so they are uh, fundamentally different things and and I, those are the, the the points i'd like to highlight in in um, the first part of my presentation um, as we're discussing today cybersecurity audits and, and assessments um, typically rely on industry best practices and and there there is uh, guidance um, out there um, from from government bodies um, but what we don't have is, is um, kind of a worldwide organization promulgating uh, statements in, in the same way that the accounting profession does. Um, and and that, that really um, creates a lot of ambiguity then in, in what you're getting when you sign up for an, an audit or assessment for cybersecurity purposes um, because they come in all ranges. Um, for me personally, I, I know there are, are strong opinions out there about what term is is more accurate, but I prefer the term of cybersecurity assessment, and and that's because um, when you procure these services, uh, I, I haven't seen a, a firm out there um, that that actually provides a cybersecurity audit opinion, and 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 they don't provide um, the, the same types of assurances within a, a financial statement audit, for for example, and so. Um, I prefer to think of it as an assessment, and and what we're assessing is a, an organization's cybersecurity maturity, and that that runs um, from the the very basic and, and immature um, cybersecurity awareness and and implementation of security standards um, to the the more mature and, and hardened networks and and systems um, that you see in in some of the larger companies and, and cybersecurity professionals, um, and so the the assessment for me um, is, is useful for uh, identifying where on that continuum your organization uh, sits. Um, the, in the majority of cases, a, a company decides to undergo a cybersecurity audit or assessment to demonstrate an adherence to um, an industry best practice or their own internal um, uh, level of, of risk acceptance. And you know it might be a, a board that requires this of your organization because they want assurance. Um, 
for a better understanding of, of um, whether or not the, the risk that they think the organization is assuming on, on the cybersecurity side is, is acceptable or, or whether or not um, uh, IT professionals and, and security professionals within the organization accurately uh, understand um, the risks that they've uh, incurred in the design and implementation and operation of their networks. Um, you can also have um, regulatory requirements. Um, certain funding streams will require a certain level of due diligence and, and um, ensuring that you've you've looked at your um, cybersecurity uh, platforms and 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 whether or not customer information is secure, whether or not um, your your client information is, is secure, and, and that's particularly important with legal firms um, because. Uh, with that, there can be um, adverse um, uh, actions taken against against your clients if there's a data breach, and then also you've got huge repu reputational risks that are involved, and and that's something I'll get into a little bit later when I talk about the um, cyber assets. Um, in terms of um, again, the the cybersecurity audits and assessments come in in all shapes and sizes, and and so what do you want to look for when you're um, uh, talking to a firm about coming in to, to look at your networks and, and uh, conduct an assessment. Um, for a lot of people in the industry, the, the first thing that comes to mind is I want to do a, a penetration test. And um, the, the part I like to highlight here is, is a lot of times that's a purely technical um, evaluation and, and, and again, looking at your your business processes and um, uh, networks, and, and and how your your people work, whether it's a uh, an office setting or distributed workforce, like uh, so many of us are, are working at today, um, the, the penetration test has its limitations, and it's it's important to remember that it's just one aspect of a complete assessment that you should be looking for. Um, a quality firm that comes in, they're going to provide you a written risk assessment. And what that means when you get that document is you know that they've done some due diligence. They've, they've done a, essentially a survey of your networks and your, your cybersecurity landscape. And they know um, or they've, they've put in some rigor to, to understand where those risks are for your organization. And they're going to use that to tailor their procedures. Um, all right, we've identified. Uh, some potential um, uh, increased risk in, in your accounting function. And so we want to spend some time looking at how your, your accounting department works, uh, uses the, their information technology assets and, and um, ensure that we uh, mitigate and, and, and are able to make recommendations for the organization to mitigate risks in, in that particular area. And so the, the written risk assessment is, is a, a marquee um, a document that you want to look for and, and what a firm delivers to you um, and, and before you, you sign that contract for them to, to do their work. And then the dovetailing into that, the, the other portion is a, a written report or assessment. Um, you don't want something purely technical. You don't want them to perform a, a pen test and just provide minimal um, supporting documentation. Um, that written report should really be a narrative that's to highlight business processes and internal control weaknesses and um, give the, the the consumers of that report a, a much better and, and broad understanding of, of how uh, cybersecurity um, is is implemented and, and performing in their organization that type of report allows you to to have a roadmap and and gives you the opportunity to start uh, building and um, hardening your networks um, as you you take those recommendations and implement them. And um, a lot of it, you'll hit on policy uh, requirements that you thought you had, but there's there's actually um, nothing uh, officially promulgated within your organization. You'll end up with, like I said, internal control weaknesses where they've identified an opportunity for an employee to. Um, uh, takes take your your uh, your IT assets when they they leave or or, or um, something some weakness in the hiring process and so when we when you um, evaluate what the, the the product is that you're going to get when you 
uh, have a, a cyber um, auditor assessment performed, you want to look for it in terms of um, business processes as well. Um, the, the more time that they spend uh, talking to your employees and, and those key uh, process owners within your organization, those managers and, and um, the, the C-suite um, uh, managers of the, the organization um, or executives of the organization, um, they're going to really be able to identify the, the weaknesses and, and the, the potential gaps in, in uh, security implementation as communication and, and data flows throughout your organization. Um, again, you want to, with that risk assessment, they're going to have an informed opinion when they go out and do their, their audit work and, and their assessment work. And so they'll be able to determine um, with a high, high degree of confidence uh, where you need to spend some time and, and, and address things um, going forward for your organization. Um, I think the, the other part that you want to be able to evaluate and talk to a firm about is, is um, what type of evidence are they going to be um, collecting and, and basing their opinion on. Um, when we think about it in these terms, it's, it is very similar to, to what a, a lot of you are used to within a, a legal framework. Um, we grade evidence based on sufficiency and reliability. And so it's worth having those conversations about what are they going to do to, to ensure that they collect enough evidence to meet that sufficiency requirement. And then um, in terms of reliability, um, let's understand whether or not the evidence they're, they're collecting is, is persuasive. Um, it comes from an, an independent source or the correct source in many cases and, and the, the nature of the evidence. Um, and and the, the real value of an audit and assessment is, is that it's done by an independent uh, third party and, and they're able to provide that objective uh, view of, of cybersecurity within your organization that you don't get uh, when you assign it as a collateral duty to your, your IT um, office manager or um, another security officer just because they're so, so close to the, the, the networks and the data a lot of times. Um, and then the final um, aspect of evidence that I'd want to hit on as I'm evaluating a, a firm and, and thinking about getting a, a uh, auditor or um, um, assessment done is thinking about the, the completeness and accuracy when, when they ask for reports. And um, a lot of firms that provide these services don't understand um, how to ensure that you've You've made a request for the, the list of um, assets, and we want to be able to identify um, each of those those IT assets and whether or not something's missing because that can be a big deal. Um, if you've got a lot of information on a on a single um, laptop, um, and so covering the completeness aspect of it is is critically important. And so just having those those conversations at, again at the beginning to ensure that everything gets um, that you've got a competent uh, company um, collecting the evidence and, and, and writing the report um, so that you can have some assurance that the, the um, opinions that they're forming and the, the recommendations that they make to you are, are valid. Um, and then the, the final thing I just wanted to close with in this part is, um, again, going into the business processes, internal controls, evaluating human behavior aspects um, that might highlight a need for training. All of these combined with something like a, a penetration test uh, are the, the multidisciplinary tools that allow you to, to make um, informed decisions as you, you go about hardening uh, your, your networks and, and systems um, to a degree that you accept risk that's, um, that your, your organization is comfortable with. Um, and it's also just kind of the first step um, as you're you're doing your business continuity planning as well, which is what Dan's going to get into. Um, once you've had an assessment done and you you've got a good inventory of your IT assets, um, then you're ready to to start that planning. Um, Dan, uh, go ahead and and pick up from here. Aaron, thanks. Um, so, Aaron, you know, kind of gave us an idea. This is kind of the inside out approach to this. But <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about is crisis response, and I, I really kind of agree with Jeff Harvey on this. We were talking before we started, 
I can get your attention if I talk about disaster response, and they're kind of synonymous. But at the strategy level, we know what our mission is in our, as an organization. And then when we get down to the planning level, we're talking about how we're going to do something. And disaster recovery is going to be inside of your cyber continuity plan or your business continuity plan. And, and it's really important that uh, we don't sprinkle cyber on top of plans after we've built them. Uh, what we do is we integrate cyber <clears throat> in it throughout it. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about how you design your planning team and what things you consider. Um, so just some of the rules that uh, I use is it's in Florida, a hurricane, because I was a member of the Florida National Guard, uh, we almost are tracking those things 10 days out. So while everybody else in Florida may be oblivious to the tropical depression south of Africa, as it approaches who knows what direction, it usually ends up in on the west of Africa, but you've got notice. So the, the tool I like to use uh, when we do these planning, and I would recommend this, is assume that you have no notice, that it caught you off guard. You, you weren't you didn't have any triggers set. And we'll talk a little bit about triggers. And what that does to you is that forces you to design a response, uh, a disaster, whether it be. And, and, and so this disaster is because your continuity plan failed to capture all the possible things that could go wrong. A flood. The flood uh, took out all of our archived files that we've got a compliance requirement to retain. We've got something stored remotely in an Iron Mountain environment on a cloud, but it costs us money to bring it back. So, so, so those are kind of the examples. The flood could be the result of a burst pipeline, which you know you have you have up in the Northeast, and you know we have freezing, or the flood could be the result of a tropical storm or a hurricane. But the approach of no notice, I think, is one of the guiding principles. And I'm obviously not going to be able to cover everything that you need to consider in your, your disaster recovery plan or your crisis, but I'll try to hit on a few. Okay, establish triggers and delegate. <clears throat> so I'll talk about delegation. Typically, you know, in an organization of 20 or more, there's going to be a level, an hierarchy level of transparency on information. So, for instance, and the ability to take action. The IT help desk is a good example. They service the clients and customers in some cases, their ability to access resources, right? Availability of resources, especially in the legal services, as we found working with Jeff and Veronica you know, is usually the first thing we try to accomplish. We want to make the data available. We want our the attorneys to have access to it, right? So there's some, there's some risk in that. But at the same time, there's the need to say, okay, I, I can make information available. I've delegated the authority to the IT department because we're going to be in this disaster recovery that you've got a, you've got some more, uh, responsibility and authority to execute in order to support us during the crisis. These are not things you want to do um, seat of the pants because there's obviously a whole bunch of potential legal ramifications. There's reputation ramifications if you don't do it right. But imagine if I opened up uh, privileges to everybody to a certain resource and then I violated by accident HIPAA and PII. Now, that is not what I intended on doing. What I intended on doing is that the attorney that was going to court the next day, despite the fact that we had a flood in Orlando, was gonna have access to information. And the only way he or she was gonna get to it is if I, in a timely fashion, uh, based on based on a basically a playbook, which is down at the bottom, I've delegated an authority to do this to the IT, now to the IT office. Now the IT office typically would never do this without approval from the C-suite, but th that's why it's important that we have triggers. The triggers are gonna tell us, are we going to execute a portion of this disaster recovery plan so that we don't end up in a, a uh, you know, a, a broken uh, organization environment where we can't, we can't protect our personnel, we can't protect their information. 
Okay, so what that means is I need to have greater transparency and I need to see data at a higher level so that the, re the recovery team that's built this disaster plan that's been endorsed by the C-suite has said, yes, we need to know that we've got enough licenses for you to dial in VPN to this resource and I've delegated the authority of the IT department to open up their access for this period of time so we can continue to service, right? Now, all of these have to be informed by policy. And the training piece is not so much training as it is exercise training, re-exercise and refinement. You're not gonna get this right the first time you do it. And, and, and if you don't do it, seat of the pants is gonna put you at, in grave risk. So the example would be help desk services as we disaggregate. The challenge there is if everybody found out on Friday, you're not coming in on Monday because of COVID. And there were a lot of organizations, big ones, federal organizations that made those decisions and they did it on a single sheet of paper. And then everybody's sitting at their apartment, at their home, and they've got Cox, you know, they've got an ISP provider, they've got a government laptop or a company issued laptop, or they have their own laptop, right? So there's a whole bunch of policy considerations there. What is my bring your own device policy? Have I verified through exercising and training how we're going to access information so that I don't end up with an innovative, highly motivated professional who says, oh, I know how I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna have Veronica go to my office, find my uh, toast, my little uh, napkin that has all my passwords on it. I'm gonna ask her to sign in. I, I know she wouldn't do this, but the point is, this is, you know, this is why it's important that we develop a recovery plan, that we train on it, that we exercise on it, so that we mitigate and reduce our greatest risk is our innovative, diligent, highly motivated professionals. I'm not saying they do it all the time, but, you know, we are the weakest link. Um, I, I've kind of beaten around the bush about the planning team. Here's, here's, here's the, the real important piece about planning team. The planning team that builds your disaster recovery plan has got to be informed as to what the, the senior leadership in the organization is interested in supporting. You've, you've got your asset uh, inventory done. You've got, you've got hopefully a risk assessment done. You've prioritized. But your team is not just cyber. As a matter of fact, some organizations, your cyber, your CISO, your cybersecurity information officer is either your operations officer or worst case in my mind is your IT person, right? So IT is a customer service thing and and your cyber, your CISO is kind of a compliance person, right? They got to be technically competent, but they're really protecting your integrity, your data, your availability of your data. And, and you know, and the, um, um, yeah, see, uh, anyway, so the point is uh, you you absolutely have to have your team be a cross section of the business units that are in there. Do not send two people in a room because if one of them isn't compliance or legal, uh, you're in trouble. If you don't have finance there who can take care of payroll and make sure that your grants are being worked and, and your funding streams in and out are working. So it is not, it is a contact sport doing executing a planning team. I would also recommend that your planning team becomes your lead response team element, not on the ground, but monitoring, leveraging the transparency of the, and the data that is being provided so so decisions can be made and your your leadership is able to be informed on those things uh, that are related to you know the confidentiality the integrity and the availability of of your of your information and and that's really what you're trying to protect in cyber all the time okay last thing before i get off playbooks bottom line in playbooks is those are the checklists that I use in my business unit. They're probably my standard procedures that I execute day to day. So that's my start point. Your planning team takes those playbooks with that business unit represented and with the entire organization represented. And if it's 
If it's payrolls a priority and it can't be at risk, then you take their standard practices and how they do things, you run it through, it, am I remaining confidential? Is integrity of data gonna be good? And then what services do I need and are they in place? So I've got a primary method of doing things, I've got an alternate method of doing things, I've got a contingency method, and then I've got an emergency method. I don't think we ever wanna to get to emergency methods, but you wanna think about your playbook in that term and then you want to build your playbook. The reason playbooks are critical is you can practice on a playbook. You don't need to trigger an entire event and run through an entire disaster recovery plan because a playbook is going to be tied to a function or a business unit. Um, and that playbook, you should include as much of your senior leadership in the exercising of it, and they should approve it because they're going to want to see that that playbook does not violate laws, pol your, your current policies, and if they do, then maybe you need to adjust your policy. Uh, I am going to hand it back to Aaron at this time. Uh, it, it's a big topic, so we can't cover it in too much detail, but hopefully that gives you some uh, insight. Go ahead, Aaron. Um, I just have a, a quick question for Veronica. Are we over time, and do you want to transition to Gaurav, or do you want me to continue? Uh, you have three minutes. All right. Um, so I'll just use that time to give a, a really quick overview of the, the cyber asset inventory. And, and what we want to do for this is do a complete accounting that encompasses our hardware, software, um, cloud services, end user, uh, mobile uh, devices, um, and then also just data. There's a, there's a lot of data out there in, in our cloud environments, and um, we oftentimes do not have a, a handle on um, on the security of it, um, who's responsible for securing it. And um, that comes down to the, the user agreements um, that you've signed with your cloud providers. Um, software is important because employees can install uh, additional software on their, their company computers. And if you don't have the right controls in place to prohibit that and, and constantly monitor that, um, you're going to have issues there and because they create additional um, threat vectors. Um, so those are the, the main um, classes of, of um, cyber assets that I wanted to talk about. The Dan already hit on the bring your own device policy. Um, that's incredibly important in today's networks because it is um, convenient to have uh, people bring their own devices to work and be able to access their enterprise email on their uh, personal mobile phone and uh, keeps them from having to carry two devices and um, but it does create significant um, issues uh, with uh, with using personal devices in, in regards to cybersecurity and, and um, I think one of the, the best ways to approach this is um, taking the time to provide that employee training to know how to to use your device safely to set up your home network uh, Wi-Fi uh, safely so that it's hardened um, and, and not put the, the onus on your, your employees um, to figure out for themselves because at the end of the day, it's, it's still your data. Um, and then uh, this is also a useful endeavor just because it highlights the, the incredible number of touch points that a single employee has. Um, they've got a company laptop, they might have a company phone, they've got um, a number of, of uh, server and, and, and cloud um, applications that they log into, and each one of these represent a, a risk that uh, needs to be considered. And uh, in, in talking about risk, I think that's where, where Gurov is going to go next, and, and um, how do you evaluate this risk and ensure that um, your your risk profile for your, your company is acceptable to, to what you, you set up for. Uh, go ahead, Veronica. All right. Thank you, Dan and Aaron. We will have time for questions at the end. Just a reminder, please continue to type your questions into the question box in your control panel. Now I will turn the time over to Gaurav. Thank you, Veronica. Um, and uh, thank you, Aaron and Dan. I, I appreciate you guys uh, covering a lot of the really important topics that are necessary for organizations today, um, especially with uh, all the ongoing craziness that we have uh, with, with COVID and, and work from home. And one, one of the things that uh, both Aaron and Dan touched on is this idea of a disaster. And I think a lot of the initial um, topics that, that 
Aaron covered with regard to an audit and an assessment and getting ready for the way in which we prepare for these things and the, the way that Dan uh, very nicely covered uh, the topic of how we have a plan and how do we make sure this plan is in place. I think that really is a good segue into what I'm going to talk about, which is the risk-based approach, um, cyber resilience, and data assets. And as we're going through the process of deciding what is important for our organization, what is it that we need to focus on? Uh, there's so many things here. There's there's a uh, topics that may have to do with regular business continuity. They may have to do with specifics about cybersecurity. They may have to do with things like is the power on? Like in Florida, we often deal with hurricanes. Here I am, and it's it's raining outside, and I'm sure at some point this season we'll have a tropical storm. So we have to deal with all the various different aspects and all the various different incidents that may arise and trigger your business continuity or your disaster plan. And one of the most important things is getting prepared for that. And so, Veronica, we'll go on to the next slide and talk about a little bit about the risk-based approach and, and what are some of the ways you can kind of filter through everything that's out there. There may be 300 requirements that you come across and you say, look, we have to do all 300 of these things in our compliance framework. We have to do all 300 of these things in our approach to security. And we wanna, we wanna make sure we're doing our best job following that CIA model that, that uh, Dan mentioned. Um, we wanna look at confidentiality. We wanna make a, a, a good attempt at, at maintaining integrity but we also want to make it available to our user base and make sure that it's not so overbearing and burdensome that they're not able to access the data that they need and conduct business. So how do we find this nice balance, sort of this triumvirate, the C, the I, and the A? And one of the things you have to look at is, is risk. So what is a risk-based approach? Well, in a, in a nutshell, risk-based approach is, is taking a look at the things that might occur the incidents that might happen, look at the vulnerabilities, look at the threats. If you have a threat and you have a vulnerability and you go, okay, here's something that we're vulnerable with. We have a specific computer system that has a particular vulnerability and then we have a threat, which might be a hacker that's trying to get into the system. Or we may have a faulty um, roof on our building and then you have this vulnerability, that's the vulnerability and then you have this threat, which is, a storm that's coming down and bearing down on you and it's going to be here in a couple of days. These are all examples of threat and vulnerability pairs. And you take those two things together and you look at them and say, how do we assess which of these is likely to happen? Which of these is not likely to happen? Which of these is going to have a huge impact on us if it does come to fruition? And which one might be a minor inconvenience? Maybe a, a small roof leak might be a minor inconvenience. If that roof leak happens to be over your server room, it might be a major inconvenience. So you have to look at risk-based approach and how do we apply this to the concepts that both Aaron and Dan were talking about. We look at an assessment. A lot of times we're buried when we first take a look at our security. When we first take a look, we say, there's so much to do here. There's so many things that we have to focus on and there's so many things that we have to, to try to conquer in a short period of time to make sure that we're either compliant or that we've reduced our risk and improved our security. You can't do all of them and you can't do all of them all at the same time. So you have to pick. And that's really where the risk-based approach comes into play. There are gonna be things like privacy laws and compliance requirements that you have to deal with. These things are regulatory, they're required and you have to meet them. So those are gonna be some of the things that you're gonna put first because you're gonna say, you know, if we don't do this, we might get fined or we might have a penalty or we might lose our contract. There's other types of risks that are a little more nebulous and they're not gonna be quite as easy to pinpoint. So a vulnerability sitting on a computer with a hacker that may or may not be out there with someone that may or may not be trying to get into your network. These are things that it's really difficult to guess how many times in a year do we think that that vulnerability is gonna actually have a threat that meets up with it and become an incident. So that's where we move on and say, how do, we, how do we quantify this risk? How do we take this risk and make sure that we can identify what's important and what's not? How do we prioritize as we're going through the process of looking at security, as we're looking at privacy, as we're looking at 
risk in general. And one of the most important tools for doing that is a business impact analysis. Now, what does that mean? It means we're gonna take a look and say, if we have threats and we have vulnerabilities and they pair up together and an incident happens, you end up with a situation. What's the cost of that situation? And what's the likelihood of that situation? Like I said before, we were talking about the roof leak. We have a roof leak over the storage room. There's nothing of importance in there and maybe nothing is gonna get damaged. Well, it's not gonna cost your business a lot of money. Same thing, if you have a, if you have a kiosk in the front of your building or a display board in your lobby and there's no sensitive information on it and somebody happens to hack that computer, you look at it and say, you know what? What's the cost to the organization? Maybe we have to buy a new computer. Maybe we have to spend a couple of hours of IT's time and cycles on repairing that computer. But if there's no sensitive data and there's no access to sensitive data, then that may be a very low risk. So that might be something you put down lower on your priority list. Now, if you find out that that same computer happens to also connect back into the server where you have sensitive data, or you find that that computer is holding data on it that maybe you didn't even know existed that is sensitive, now you have to turn around and say, okay, that risk, that impact to the business just went up. The average cost of a breach, at, I think as late as 2019, Kahneman Institute came out with a study and they said it's, it's 3.9, almost $4 million is the average cost of a data breach. Now you have to think about this. Can your organization absorb a $3.9 million cost? That doesn't mean they're all 3.9 million, it's an average. So you might have a $200,000 breach, or you might have a two or 10 or $15 million breach. But the idea is that data breaches cost money. And a risk-based approach is the fastest way to reduce that expected value or the potential value of a breach for your organization. Veronica, if you wanna to go to the next slide, we can take a look. So the next thing we're gonna talk about, and this dovetails very nicely with what Dan was talking about with business continuity, cyber resilience. What is cyber resilience? This is really making sure that your organization can continue to operate. Depending on what stressors and pressures are placed on your organization, you want to be able to continue to move forward, continue to operate. And you're gonna take a look at how flexible your organization is under pressure. If you have, again, I like using the hurricane example because I live in Florida and we deal with them all the time. But if all of a sudden you find that there's a hurricane coming and it's going to disrupt your operations, how flexible are you? How much have you planned for being able to operate when that disaster or that incident occurs? So again, you look and say, in an ideal world, we would have 10 levels of redundancy for everything that we own. Well, as soon as you put that plan in front of your board or in front of your leadership group, you're gonna come back and realize that's an expensive plan. So they're gonna want us to cut something out of that budget, probably a whole lot. How do we get the best bang for our buck? And again, that's where risk comes in. You have to factor risk in. In Florida, we've had 100, maybe 200 years of history that we can go back and look at. What do hurricanes do? How frequently did they hit? How strong are the winds? What are, what are the different times of year that a hurricane hits? So we may find that you have some flexibility in your business continuity or your cyber resilience plan. You may not be in a situation where you say, hey, the likelihood of a hurricane hitting in January, for those of you who don't know, is very low. We're not gonna get a hurricane in Florida in January. It's highly unlikely. So the risk of that happening in January or February or March, very low. You take a look at that and you calculate that and factor it in to your business impact analysis. How does it impact your business? How hard is it gonna be for you guys to recover? And how hard is it gonna be for you to continue operations under those types of pressures? So first thing is identify critical components and systems within your organization. What are the what are the key things that keep the lights on in your organization? You may not have to 
have every single process in your business function. In fact, you may choose that it's too expensive to do that. But you wanna look at what those processes are and how you can maintain the ones that are key, crucial, and important to your business. And then you can set up a system, maybe a tiered system, you call them tier one is the most important, tier two is the second most important, tier three, and you can create categories of systems and categories of processes. And don't always think of a system in terms of computers. Sometimes these processes are just as important in a physical capacity. You have a process about mailing out checks if people get paychecks in the mail. But guess what? That physical component of mailing the check to them, a lot of people are direct deposit, but some may not be. We have to physically get that in the mail. We're now depending on the postal service and other downstream entities that might also introduce risk into that process. So how critical is it that somebody gets their paycheck? It's probably a pretty critical component of what you do every day. So the next thing you wanna take a look at as you're going through with cyber resilience, as you're going through with overall resilience, business continuity, and the process in which you evaluate criticality, you wanna make sure that you have a good understanding. And I'm pointing back to that business impact analysis. I'm pointing back to that plan that Dan and Aaron talked about, where you have a good assessment, you have a good understanding of what the, what the environment looks like, you quantify that with the business impact analysis, and then you make your best decisions about how to make sure that we can identify those and prioritize the ones that are most important to our business. <clears throat> so I recently underwent a project with Community Legal Services in Florida. And I can tell you that one of the most important aspects is communication with the clients. Now, the courts sometimes shut down. Sometimes you find that um, the courts may not shut down and, and you might find yourself in a situation where you have to respond. There's, there's a, a 20 day response period or some of the other important timeframes that are critical to the process of a case or the progress in a case, those timeframes may not stop tolling if the court systems don't shut down. If you're in a unique situation where maybe your business was impacted and others weren't, or it wasn't a regional event or a countywide event, so you might find yourself in a position where you have clients that are depending on you. They're depending on you to make sure that you file an answer, that you file a response, that you fire, file other critical components to their case. And meanwhile, that time is gonna to continue to toll while you are trying to get your business back up and running. So you have to look at what these critical processes are. The, the project that I went with uh, community legal services, some of the key pieces there were being able to handle what happens if we have a client that has a need? What happens if, if there are pleadings that come in that we have to answer? How do we make sure that those things can get answered and responded to? Some of that requires us to go to a cloud-based environment. Some of that requires us to go to a, a work-from-home environment. Um, fortunately, during the COVID disaster that everybody's uh, experiencing right now, this pandemic that we're in, there's a lot of things that are also shutting down. So maybe your resilience wasn't as important because the court system also stopped pulling those times. But if they hadn't, if it was a different type of disaster, if it was a different type of, of peril, you may find yourself in a position where you've even possibly committed malpractice by not being prepared enough to make sure that you can respond on your client's behalf. Do you want to go to the next slide, Veronica? So one of the most important things for us to do is look at risk we've talked about, but also data assets because here's where a lot of the risk can be trimmed down. Do you have an inventory? Do you know what data do you have? Do you have social security numbers? Do you have credit card information? Do you have banking and checking information that might be uh, an exhibit to a pleading that might have routing and account numbers on it? Do you have information that is going to be something that is a, a little bit of a honeypot or a target for a hacker? And then who owns that data? Are you just the custodian of that data? Are you in fact, the owner, did you create the data? Oftentimes as a law firm, we're not the creator of the data, we're just the custodian. So we have to remember this, that we're introducing risk if we get hacked or if we have a breach, or oftentimes if we may only have the copy of record, 
the only copy of record for a particular um, document, like a original note or a mortgage. These are all things that we have to look at and say, we have to make sure that we take advantage of our risk reduction. Now, if somebody hacks into one of our systems, if we remove that data, if it's not business critical, if it doesn't support a particular service for our organization, we need to make sure that we can remove that data and then it's no longer a target. Again, risk, ranking the risk and the impact on your business is probably one of the most critical aspects of what we do in the security field. And with that, I'll pass it back over to you, Bronner. Thank you, Gaurav. And now we're gonna go ahead and start the question and answer portion of today's webinar. And I'm gonna ask the panelists if they could go ahead and turn on their cameras. Thank you. So the first question I have is, how does this sort of risk assessment relate to the business of legal aid slash courts? Dan, do you want to take that one or you're on mute, Dan? Gaurav, I was going to recommend that you take it, uh, given sure. your back. Yeah. I, I saw your mouth moving, but I couldn't tell if it was uh, if you were answering or, or saying something else. So fair enough. So um, how does this sort of risk assessment uh, relate to the business of legal aids and courts? So I touched on it a little bit in my presentation, but one of the most important aspects of, of what we do as an attorney is maintain confidentiality of client data. We are a trusted advisor. We have not just uh, a responsibility, but often an ethical responsibility, a professional responsibility that goes along with us having a bar license that requires us to maintain the confidentiality of our client information. So that C in the CIA model is very important for a law firm. Sometimes it's secret information, sometimes it's information that isn't publicly available. I know court pleadings and those type of documents become public record, but there are often components that we might be using for drafting those things that are not public information that could give an adversary or an opponent an advantage or even the ability to uh, hack into one of our, our clients' data files if, for instance, they have social security information, uh, sensitive information that might be on their two-factor questions for banking, things like that. So there's all sorts of different ways in which we could involuntarily disclose information about a client and that's important and that's a risk that we need to make sure that we uh, that we maintain uh, good good security around. Um, you know, if you have a uh, if, if you have an old file system, and I mean paper files like in boxes and in cardboard, and they're sensitive or important or original documents in those, and we have a flood in Florida or a hurricane comes through or another type of disaster, a fire, and those documents destroy get destroyed you might be in violation of Florida bar rules or even bar rules in other states that require you to make sure you maintain that client's paper files. And if we're not doing a good job of that, if we don't have a backup, you may not even know it. it you, you might even not even have looked in those files in the last 10 or 20 or 40 years, depending on, on how long your firm has been uh, serving the community. Um, there might be files there that you aren't even aware of. So doing a data discovery, that inventory process that I know Aaron touched on, it's really important to include paper files and other types of data in that inventory process so that we can make sure we give a good, thorough assessment of your risk for your information in your organization. Thank you, Gaurav. Uh, Veronica, I, I have something to add to that because mm -hmm. One of the assessments we did um, was almost identical to what Gaurav described. There was a, a storage closet or a vault, call it what you will. Vaults are only as secure as the procedures you have in place to protect them. So this had nothing to do with flood risk, had more to do with inside of that storage closet was a copier machine, makes total sense, right? probably uh, had the ability to journal digitally or by, you know, or a log of who made copies. Um, 
but the control of that room, that door is critical. And, and the reason this is cyber is because there's a way to exfiltrate data on some of these copier machines, right? So if I make copies, I'm using an information system. I may even be able to scan it and send it to my email outside of the building. So while it's almost purely physical, whether I control the access to that room or not, that's the archive. We're archiving it. We're in compliance with policy and, and regulation for uh, you know holding files and then disposing of them. But if we're not careful, we have a cyber crime as a result of physical security. So that's why I go back to whenever we're doing any of our assessments and we're taking a look at our um, you know our risks. We want to make sure that we understand that cyber doesn't start with with digits. It's we're leveraging technology and our cyber infrastructure to to we. I mean, you know, whoever's perpetrating this, and it may not it may not even be a deliberate leakage of information, but that violates confidentiality. And I think what the root cause of these type of things goes back to availability of information so in this case the key was on somebody's desk and if you asked for it you didn't sign a document that said you took it that you just grabbed the key you went in unaccompanied and 99.9% .9 of the time nobody's going to do anything wrong with that but that system lends itself to a vulnerability it's a huge risk and it's because we're trying to make things available and there's always should be a really good tension between confidentiality, integrity, and availability. If you can, if you can have, if you sense a tension between those, you're probably going in the right direction. If you have so much availability that there's no way you can maintain the integrity of the data, whether the one is a one or an L, or you and you can't guarantee that it's going to remain confidential, you may have too much availability right that leg may be too too tall and that three-legged stool is not going to stand up as well anyway that's all i've got on that Aaron, do you have anything else to add to the topic no i i don't have anything additional but i, I thought that was a, a great aspect that uh Gaurav brought up about the the physical aspect of files and and how they relate to cybersecurity. but i'll go ahead and leave their answers you know as is Okay, well, due to time, we don't have any more time for additional questions. So I just want to go ahead and thank Dan and Aaron and Gora for being here with us. And thank you all for joining us today. We hope you found this information and dialogue valuable in understanding the importance of knowing your organization's internal vulnerabilities and the importance in building a secure, vigilant, and resilient organization. Thanks again and enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, thank you so much to Legal Services of Mid-Florida and all of the speakers that we've got here today. Uh, we really appreciate um, the help and consider joining the LSNTAP email list. Uh, it's a wonderful resource and these are the type of topics that we talk about all the time.